Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast Full Steam Ahead Edition. It is Purdue week. Hey Purdue yo. coming to Nebraska. I'm Evan with Sam, with Jimmy from the Omaha World Herald. And how appropriate is it that on Halloween weekend, Purdue Pete, maybe the scariest mascot in all of college sports, is coming to Lincoln and Memorial Stadium? Oh, it is up there. He's definitely one of the one of the one of the stranger ones. He's Scarier than the football game that's going to be happening at the stadium, though. Oh, oh yeah, train wreck. <laughs> Purdue ah, games are kind of train, train wrecky wreck. and physical, Jimmy. Yeah. They they always have a little bit of sloppiness to them. Turnovers, mistakes, wild swings in play, injuries. In, oh yeah, injuries, especially there. Yes, they have a they have a they have a actually a very advanced turf management program there. And they continue to use Bermuda grass and yeah, West Lafayette know, yeah. for their for their football field. How do you know this? Well, they make a big deal out of okay. it. And and what we we uh, to be honest with you, Nebraska's had many serious serious injuries mm-hmm. at this place. Uh, so Spencer Long, I think, was out for maybe the whole season, right, with an ACL in 2013. Demorne Pearsonell in 2015, out. Yep. Miles Farmer out. All turf injuries, all like stepped funny, tore up something. Anyway, the grass there is kind of spongy, like it's like a golf course fairway. So it's pretty, it's aesthetically pretty, but your feet can get stuck in there, and yeah, you have turned ankles and all kinds of yeah leg injuries. It's, it's, that's it's happened not good. before, but and it also turns brown late in the year because it just dies, but it co- you know it stays together. So yeah, it's a. It, these have always been kind of ugly games. As for Purdue Pete, yeah, he's he's somewhat. What's those know. black eyes, man? Yeah. They stare right into your soul. Mm-hmm. Well, any mascot, I mean, the the idea that your face is never changing, you don't have any real expression, that, that's kind of creepy to me. Yeah. I think the Stanford tree is a little concerning, too. That's, it's kind of a scary It's just kind of junky. I mean, you it know. It is. Uh, yeah. You know. It looks like a Christmas ornament. That's right. It's like but the, that's concerning. It's the recyclable know. from hell. I mean, Purdue Pete's just. I don't know. He, he can if if he popped around the corner and those unblinking eyes uh, just stared at you and discerned all your fears in like two seconds. I, you know, no thanks. I mean, if you saw if you saw Herbie in an alleyway late at night and he's just looking at you, would you feel great? I would not. No, I would not. No. Anyone wearing a head like I that, think it's, smirk would I be. think it's the, yeah. the plastic kind of sheen on the face that does it. Like it reminds me. Have you guys ever seen The Purge? It reminds me of those masks. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's That's a bunch what of mascots Purdue remind me of. Yeah, mm-hmm. vigilante justice. Um, so, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, ah. we're, we're going to talk a little football today. We're going to talk some basketball today. We have some exhibitions coming up this week. Going to delve into some hoops. Um, let's get into the big red idea, though. By Nebraska coming off the bye week. What do you guys think of the timing of that? Was that good? Uh, was that a good time for a bye week for Nebraska coming off that Minnesota game, but also coming off of eight straight? Was that a bad time for a bye week? How do you kind of break down uh, just the timing of that as it relates to what's coming up here with Purdue? It's a week late, but if you're talking about going forward, I think it was well timed. I think what you would ideally want to do when you come off a bye week is have home games, mm-hmm. because then it's kind of like you had a bye week, and then you get you know, you get to kind of, you know, reacclimate into and then you just flow right into a home game. So what Minnesota had where they, they beat Purdue and then they had a bye week home game. Ideal. Nebraska got that too. It just came a week late, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think ideally you would have had a bye week, then you play Purdue, then you go to Minnesota, then you come back and play Ohio State. Um, but but that's not the way it helped. So and Nebraska made a willing choice to uh, play eight games in a row. They knew it when they put the Ireland thing together. And so they, they're doing it again next year. They're not playing eight games in a row next year. They're playing, I think, six. But they did that. I mean, it's, it should benefit them on the back end that they have two bye weeks over the course of six weeks. They should be very, very fresh at the end of the season, um, even though in that Minnesota game they looked run down. Hmm. I, I agree with Sam. It came a week late. Anytime you're talking about lacking juice – um, for for a big time divisional game, anytime you're you know you they just didn't have the same uh, get up and go that they usually did at the, in the first half of that Minnesota game. It cost them a game. Um, but again, I, I think Sam took the words right out of my mouth in terms of like 
the if they couldn't get the bye last week, this is probably the, the second best time to get it. They needed to rest. I mean, they had a lot of injuries, a lot of nagging injuries that needed to be healed. They had they needed to, as the coaches have been telling us this week, they needed to take some time to evaluate some of the bigger picture stuff that they've been they haven't had as much time to to do with game game prep game game prep game game prep just that that cycle uh tumbling upon itself for the for the first eight weeks of the season they needed a breath they have a breath and it's it's funny we we had i feel like we're kind of exactly where we started at the beginning of the season um it's kind of a similar opponent Purdue's not not we as we know now not nearly as bad as illinois but a team that i think we all think nebraska can beat and but we don't have confidence that they can actually do that because of what we've seen. We took a really crazy roller coaster ride to get here. The lows of the Illinois and Michigan State losses, um, the highs of almost Michigan, almost Oklahoma, thrash Northwestern, and now we're kind of settling right back. It's like the roller coaster came back around. We're ready to hop on the ride again uh, with Purdue. It's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. What I have found interesting this week is like the, the buy afforded everybody the opportunity not from the players perspective so much but from the fan base to take kind of a big picture assessment of things so you know you're, you're, you're going week in week out week in week out game 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 opponent previews you're looking ahead and so with that week off it felt like everybody kind of took a step back and said okay well what's what's the state of the recruiting class okay what's uh, the deal with all the one score losses and it felt like it was a very kind of big picture Red zone offense systemic sort of week to break things down what's the status of Scott Frost moving forward you know and now it's back into Purdue week and next week it'll be Ohio State week and then I think we'll have another week after that of sort of what are gonna what's going to happen with the the junior eligible guys will Adrian Martin like all those sort of uh, thoughts and debates are going to crop up in two weeks but I thought that was what was fascinating was uh, sort of the the cumulative toll of the season kind of manifested itself. I thought in, in how people viewed Nebraska in the last week. Yeah, I agree. I, I I don't I I would be really surprised if the majority of the contributors who were in that junior class came back, Evan. Wouldn't you? Uh maybe. I mean, that'll be a good discussion for down the road for sure. Yeah. Well, I just even this week, it just. I just uh, I think this is it. I think this is the stretch run. I think this is the time. This is the place. Uh, Nebraska's older guys, I think, plan on making their stand now, and and kind of making, you know, they have a perfect opportunity. Sort of starting with Purdue because they need to win some games here at the end, but the next three teams they play are the the boogeymen mm-hmm. of Nebraska football. Mm-hmm. So this week. They need to play their butts off and win and and get that confidence back. And then the next three weeks, they're gonna be they're gonna be going, they're gonna be slaying dragons or trying to. Because those are the three teams they can't beat. And mm-hmm. have and they've come close in various ways to two of them and the other one not so much. But those are the three teams. Those are the three villains that sit on this on Nebraska football. And so I feel like this week is about, guys, we need to win. And we need to work on it, and we're fresh, and we're not going to make any excuses, and we've got a home game, and we're going to go out and do this, this, and this. And then after that, I think they those seniors have an opportunity, or the juniors who are seniors have an opportunity to make their statements against the teams that they haven't beaten. Hmm. It, just, it feels like a, an opportunity here down the stretch to do the things that you say you want to do, even if you don't win all the games, but to leave it all out on the field. And then to, you know, I don't know, maybe Ireland is the is the carrot that brings a couple of them back. But um, I just uh, I just feel like it would be a lot uh, after after those four games, especially if they make a bowl to 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 be able to. Yeah, let's let's go and do it again. You know, it's one more time. Year six. This feels like the last this feels like the last month. And I think they're going to have a strong month. I do. I understand that. I understand where you're coming from, Sam, where. They, these guys are beaten down at this point, but at the same time, I would feel strange with them. I would feel strange about them hanging their hats on, even if it is you know they get to a bowl game and they beat you know two teams that they haven't been able to beat before. Yeah. It would be strange to be like, okay, six and six bowl game. Maybe it's six and seven, seven and six, whatever. We did it. Yeah, that's that's the capper. That's the legacy right there. Yeah. That would feel that would feel you know flat to me. 
Yeah. I think, I mean, that's the one hand. And then the other hand is kind of like, okay, I've been here for five years, six years. It's, it's time, you know? Like, I, I get that sense with oh, some Oh, I totally get the, the grind. The, the grind argument makes total sense to me. You know, but I graduated in four and a half years. Am I really coming back for year six? Yeah. I'm kind of backing up the guys behind us here. Yeah. Am I really going to play in the NFL? Like, I mean, there's Dan, a whole Dan lot Dan as well have a master's degree by Sprint. Yeah. So. He graduated in, what, three years? Mm-hmm. I think it was, yeah. He'll have a master's degree. There's not, I mean, you know, unless he wants to go for the first year of a Ph.D., how much is you know? So there's there's examples of that. These guys have all been great in the classroom, all the rest. So it's it's. Uh, I feel like this is it. This is a stretch for not all of them. You know, I I, I think like Edova Maka Clemens will probably come back. Um, and I'm trying to think of another. I, I you know, Phil Darius Payne, Jordan Riley. Yeah, but the guys that we're all thinking of in our mind, we don't need to say their names because everybody kind of knows who we're talking about. I think they want to finish right. Finish this thing well, you know, and it was too quick in 2018 to say that the culture was set. I don't think that was true. I don't think that I, it's not nothing against Luke Gifford and and and, um, you know, Foster. Uh, but it wasn't quite set as we saw in 2019. Clearly, yeah. Uh, but this is an opportunity to set it finishing strong, which I think they can do. Don't you, don't you think Purdue is a decent matchup for Nebraska yes. too for all for all the reasons Minnesota wasn't because of their kind of plotting ability to plod down the field and Nebraska's defense that bends but doesn't break. I mean this this is a the kind of style Nebraska's defense wants to to go up against these Ideally, pass heavy styles. I mean they can they can get you. Uh sure. they've got good schemes and you know they've never failed to score against Nebraska. They scored 42, 31 and 27 in the first 3 years. So they'll score but their defense hasn't been very good against Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska they've allowed 28, 27, and 37. It's and interesting because both of those defenses are having a resur- sort of a resurgence this year. They are. But Purdue's defense is, is much better than it's been in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, some of that's the teams they've played. But you know what? They, and they, they held a very good Oregon State offense to 350 yards, and Oregon State's going to go to a bowl. I mean, they could even win the Pac-12 North uh, if they beat Oregon. So – you know, Purdue's played better offenses, honestly, uh, than a lot of these other defenses in the Big Ten that haven't. They played Notre Dame. Notre Dame's not a great offense, but they held them back. You know, they've played some pretty good teams. So I I think Purdue's defense is much improved, and they have some players in that front seven. Their defensive line is one of the three or four best in the Big Ten, and I'm not kidding. Like, they have def- they've always had players on that D-line. Where they've struggled is in the back end. They've never had great safeties and corners and things like that. They're not great tacklers, but their defensive line is legit. I think the other interesting part is, you know, it, it was well noted that Purdue has had Iowa's number over the years uh, recently. Wisconsin was the other way, where they they never beat Wisconsin. And then Nebraska is sort of a has been a 50-50 game for them the last handful of years. So, you know, with it, it, I just think the matchup's really interesting with Nebraska coming off the bye, with Purdue coming off a Wisconsin game where you always are kind of a little beaten down physically. Iowa that's, and Wisconsin. That's pretty historic. Double, double date. Yeah. Interesting we, is, a, is certainly a word for Nebraska in 50-50 games. Certainly yeah. a word. Yeah, they are. They haven't they've, – they've struggled a lot to, to finish those games. I don't know that they're – you know, I think some of that – I think Frost was talking about that a little bit this week, the, the comments about – wanting to put his team in situations where it's high leverage last week and and kind of seeing how that goes. I think a lot of that's probably red zone. I think a lot of that's probably third down. Um, Casey it, Rogers was saying it was two-minute drill, four-minute drill, end of the yeah. game type stuff. Well, they definitely, yeah, they definitely have to get better in those in those circumstances. They have to get better late in games. Um, and the, the thing that I would say, and I feel like I've got enough visual memory, and you, you've covered the whole era too, is their two-minute drills on when the game's on the line don't even get past the 50. You know what I'm saying? Northwestern 2020 is about the only exception I can think of there. Right, they got down there. That's right. But, but a lot often. of times they don't – it doesn't even get going. It's mm-hmm. not like it's, oh, we got down to the seven, and, you know, we just need one more play. On the two-minute drills, they get to about the 50, and then they start doing shit. Yeah. Like Iowa. Let's Iowa run a quarterback year. in. Right. You know, that was two years ago. They got to the 40, and you know, he – they struggle to get inside the you know the twenty, so I think that's part of it. And then the four minute drills run the clock out, which they they struggle to do too. So hmm. yeah, it's uh, 
it's a program where you, it's interesting. You look at the numbers on offense, and this is where stats don't always tell you the truth. If we all sit here in a table, I think we'd all say Nebraska's defense has a, month, a, a cohesion and an understanding and a sense to it that even when they fail, we know why they fail, whereas the offense, you don't really know what's going to happen. It's an adventure. Every drive. You're surprised when they score. At least I am. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised. I'm like, well, I, what's going to go wrong? Oh, yeah. I mean, Minnesota, right before the Martinez safety two weeks ago, I commented to you, I think, Jamie, I said, Nebraska doesn't ever come through in these situations. They just don't. One play later, safety, and... You're probably looking at each other like, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, that was uh, that was, that was was uncanny. Yeah. 89 yards away, five minutes left. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a two-minute. Yeah, time wasn't a factor, really. The first play, you're running, guys, 30 yards down. I'm like, run the football. You got to run play in there, don't you, for four, three, three, four yards. Give your quarterback second and seven. Instead, you're sending everybody out on a route. First play. Got to get 30 yards. What for? Are you going to – because the whole point there is you want to score and leave the other team no time. Mm -hmm. So you might as well take some time on the front end because you you don't want to leave a minute and a half for Minnesota. You want to leave like eight seconds. And you know Adrian's banged up too. That's the other thing. We yeah. didn't know. We didn't know as much about it as they seem to. After as they they let on that they knew after the game. You know your quarterback's he banged needs up. To practice that right. Way, yes. Why are you? You know why are you putting him in a position where he might have to create more time for himself? I'll say this much for the injury stuff. Adrian Martinez is a really good dude. I don't think he enjoys having people make excuses for his play, and I think they should think a little harder about the way they talk about that you know everybody knows there's something up with his jaw because he got you know popped tagged at michigan state and hit hard and people know that stuff if if he's good enough to play he's out there if he's not he's not and if you got to bring somebody in to run the football you know on on your you know your quarterback run package damn it you got a guy that can at least do that i don't know how much else he can do but he can do that he, can, he, he might be a better zone read guy than Taylor, than, uh, than Adrian. So they've got to think, get more creative with how they bring that kid on the field because I think Logan Smothers can handle a inverted veer or a zone read. He can. And they had an opportunity to do something there. That guy that for Minnesota, it's not like he's been, you know, the guy they brought in the game. It's not, like, not like he's been playing for four years. Prior to him, it was Seth Green. And you knew what they were going to do when they brought him in anyway. That's right. And he did it well. Uh, until they didn't, and they scored a touchdown on the pl- on the first drive. So I don't mm-hmm. know if that was, well, we don't want to be, we don't want to do to Adrian what we did when, you know, Luke was here. And they didn't even do it with Luke very often. You know, Luke comes in in the 2020 Minnesota game. We figure, oh, you know, Adrian got something happened. And Adrian, again, gets a little hurt. And Luke comes in. Well, at least we know he can run. What's he do? Throws it twice. Yeah, right. Throws an interception. Mm-hmm. Like, do you guys not? Anyway. We could go on a tangent on about that, but that's the issue that I think lies at the heart of the offense and why I wrote what I wrote a couple of weeks ago. This is like, you guys don't really know who's going to come through for you on offense. On defense, I think they have a pretty good idea, and if a kid screws up, he screws up. But it wasn't because you had no idea. And when they put Jack Quesiant out there, they didn't really know on that play. And then they pulled him, you know, to a drive later, and they put in Morrison. Late in, you know, late in the midway through the fourth Such quarter. Such a weird Let's time. Let's just put in him in. Let's see if he can do something. That's not – that ain't the move. Or let's take out Betts and Manning, well, two of your more dynamic playmakers. Well, they did. That's uh, – the Morrison Against thing. Against Michigan? Yes, they did. The Multiple games, yeah. The, the Morrison thing is grasping at straws, searching for answers that, that aren't there. That's one of the – I mean – at that critical juncture of a game to make that kind of change. I get it. Your options well, are limited. Function in the pass game. That's why. It wasn't yeah. There. But yes, it is grasping yes. straws because the guy they normally put out there is Ramir, um, and then it was Gabe Irvin, and you know, and they know that okay, we're in a situation now where we got to throw the football, and we don't know if this guy can do that, and Marquis Step is whatever, um, so we got to put in Sevian. Like it's. And you feel for them because they're trying really hard, and they're probably going to, you know, somebody is going to figure this out at the running back position and the wide receiver position. But it does feel like at times the guys on, that are on the field aren't necessarily the best guys. And they they have improved their offense. We have to be honest about they've hit more big plays. They've done the they, the play designs are better. Matt Lupic deserves a lot of credit for that. So does Scott. Um, but it's the personnel. It's the Jimmys and the Joes. Um, 
you know, in those circumstances, they're just not, you don't know who you can count on. Well, particularly up front. I mean, they're, that's right. I mean, they're kind of, it seems like they're kind of stuck with the group that they have right now, which was the same group that started the year. Yeah. That group's not getting it done. They're not great. No. They're particularly in pass pro. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're asked to do a lot. That's true. That That's true. They're asked they're asked to they're asked to fake run, block pass. They're asked to do a lot in that offense. Um I don't know if you guys know who Dan Orlovsky is. I I respect him a lot. He's a former UConn quarterback who's now a He's the uh, Okay, he's the guy who took the safety. When he was the Detroit Lions, he ran out of the back at the end zone. That's I how so. I think that's how most people know him, right? Yeah, but okay. he's good. Yes, like, no, so he's he called, he's a good analyst. He, he called the Penn State Illinois game, and he made a comment actually about Patrick Mahomes, um, on uh, you know, because just people are catching up to him. They're catching up. Mm-hmm. People are catching up to the Chiefs. And what he said was, when you build an offense that's that's rooted in RPO, everything's run pass option, everything you you don't develop a quarterback's pocket presence. And you also make it hard for your offensive line. He put this on Twitter. You make it hard for your offensive line because every play is a run pass set. You're not always sure what you're going to see. They don't. They have some dropbacks in their offense. And the, and the, the intentional grounding safety was a drop back. I don't think that was necessarily Bryce Benhart's fault that that happened. Um, but a lot of times, in some, you don't always know what your quarterback behind you is going to do. There's 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 pluses and minuses to that offensive scheme and one of the minuses is you give up negative plays because your offensive line is often trying to do two things at once and you know we can say this with confidence uh, I, don't, I don't think you covered mike riley did you 2017 did you okay they didn't give up a lot of sacks they didn't no i suppose not now some of that was tommy when tommy was oh, there cause Tan- tanner lee and they didn't give up 2017. a ton. They did not give up a ton of them. They gave up a ton early. Oregon, Northern Illinois. But as that season went on, you go back and look when they played Penn State. Tanner threw it 55 times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. They stopped giving them up, partially because Mike Cavanaugh's a good pass pro. Oh, well. And they they got good at it because they were used to doing it over and over and over again. Yep. And, yeah, Tanner Lee did get knocked out with a concussion. In the middle. So I get it. I get all that. So they gave up some, but relative to the number of dropbacks they had, they were pretty good. Yeah, right. I agree. And, you know, there, there's just things like you watch Matt Farniak, and Matt Farniak was not a great pass pro guy at Nebraska um, because he was trying to do three things all the time, you know, and the, now he's in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So there's just things that I think people don't always understand about how that offense works and the weaknesses of it. And it really helps to watch the NFL on Sunday because then you can watch Lamar Jackson, and you can watch Patrick Mahomes, and you can say these are the these are unbelievable elite athletes who are doing incredible things, and their offensive line often seems like it's not very good, and some of that's because they don't always know what the quarterback's going to do because mm. he's so dynamic, and it's been notable to watch people catch up on Holmes while there's been some other Mahomes, while there's some other quarterbacks who are relatively immobile and just kind of standing there who are having, you know, renaissance kind of seasons. Yeah. Now Josh Allen's both, but but there's interesting to watch some of these guys that are kind of stationary having having good seasons. And Tom Brady's guys know what he's going to do. Oh, they do. Yeah. As uh, do Joe Burrows. And Joe Burrow's not a runner. Yeah, good point. They're more subtle pocket movers. Right. They move. Right. They just don't they're they're not they're not running in big U shapes back in the formation they're you know a step here a step there right and martinez has gotten better at moving up into the pocket to be clear i think what they've worked with martinez on is don't bail out of the play and roll hard to your right and throw across your body to god knows who and risk an interception so they've gotten better at him sticking in that pocket what happens i think when he gets there is there's pressure in his face, and he's not gonna he's not gonna throw an interception. So he takes it, you know, he takes it right in the face mask, and that's tough, you know. But they're not turning it over. You go back and watch Adrian, for example, two years ago. We saw a lot of that. He loves to run to his right. Yeah, he'd bail out and he'd go right, try to improvise. Yeah, and he would try to do something, and it didn't always go well. And a couple once he got hurt. I mean, Northwestern, he was out of the pocket and. 
So I think what they found is he would get hurt out there, do other things. Let's keep you in the pocket, keep you safe. He got hurt. That He hurt that ankle against Michigan on that fumble because Aiden, Aiden Hutchinson came up from behind and wrenched him on, you know, grabbed him at his bot, at his legs, hurt him. He fumbled. That's, yep. why you don't, that's why you don't do that on third and two. We've talked about this so many times on it. When you do it, you risk it. And he got hurt because of that. Hmm. I think that's when his ankle got hurt because Agent Aiden Hutchinson went right at his ankle. So yeah. One other big picture question you kind of got onto this a little bit, Sam, is what's really on the line over these last four games? Like, yeah, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Iowa have held Nebraska down for a long time, but like, you know, the range of outcomes here is anywhere from finishing three and nine to bowl eligibility on the other end and exercising a few demons. I'm just, you know, as you look at, I guess, what Nebraska football is beyond whether they go to a bowl game or not, because that's kind of the thing everyone's focused on right now. Does Can it end in any other way than some sort of assistant coaching changes in the offseason, a tense offseason, and a hot seat 2022? I mean, it feels like that's what we're headed toward regardless of how this thing ends. Mm-hmm. Do, do you feel like... There are other possible outcomes uh, for into the off season and next year uh, that can change with these last four games. What do you think, Jimmy? I mean, if they come out and win all these games, thirty-five nothing, sure, sure, that yeah, could that could change. Impossible, sure. But um, no, I feel like we're kind of in a, a state of of stasis here. I think that first of all, we have most of the body of work that we're going to have from the season. The season is over half done, right? So. That is, you know, you're, we're going to have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen, of, of where everyone is uh, progress-wise because we've seen most of the uh, data points. Right. Now, I guess we could, I think it's more likely that we could see something spring the other way. Like if, if things start to go real south, they lose out and, you know, they lose to Purdue close. I don't see Purdue blowing them out. But the next three games are ugly maybe we do start to see a complete reshuffle. But in terms, I do think something's going to change on the staff pretty much no matter what, unless they put together a real hoorah of a run. And at that point, Sam, to our point earlier, yeah, go ahead and for the, for the older guys, if you want to leave on that kind of note, go ahead. But I feel like we we are going to be stuck in that middle ground, Evan. Defensively, you know, let's break it down by sides of ball. Mm-hmm. You know, let's think about it maybe the way Trev might. I don't know the, how Trev will think about it. I think defensively, you look at the outlay, and the outlay looks really good, right? Um, I think the depth that they have, the experience that they would have coming back, you can see the waves over the next three to five years. Three to four. You can see it. Um, okay, so Damian Daniels leaves. They know who they're going to put in there. They, they know. Uh, you're, getting, you're probably getting DeAndre Thomas back. Uh, You're getting Ty back. You're getting Casey back. You're getting Nash Hupmiker back. They like Nash a lot. Mm -hmm. They kind of know where they're going there. They, I think uh, JoJo's a question mark because obviously you have to replace him, but maybe you feel really good about what Isaac Gifford's going to do. And then they have a very good idea of what they want to do at middle linebacker. They have a weakness there on third down, covering guys. they got to figure that out, but I think they've identified it. We've identified it. Need to go in the transfer portal and get a pass rusher need to develop somebody that's a big question mark I think secondary is going to be better next year even if Cam and those guys leave I think the guys they got behind it are good and they're sound and and I think one of the things that I like about a lot of those guys Newsom included Newsom's a sound player he's not perfect but he's sound I think Buford will be sound I think they're gonna be all right offensively is the to me is the big question you can solve some problems in special teams by by specialists you've got to recruit them you got to go get them you got to hope they're right. Offensively, to me, is where, if you're talking vision, the whole program is rooted in who are we going to be on offense, how are we going to score this game style where we want to score first, et cetera, et cetera. They've really, they've really struggled to make that real since he's since Frost's been here. How do you get to the point where you make it real? And to me. You've got to get really good skill players. You've got to get the skill players that you know are the most talented players on the team on the field. And that's a 
that'll probably be for Frost if he's still here. And I, I kind of expect him to be, honestly. A come to Jesus with not only those players, but his, but his assistants. Like, guys, you know the most talented players in your room are X, Y, and Z, and they're not playing very much. That has to change. Like, we've recruited enough forward. You know, he can say to his staff, guys, we've recruited enough four stars on offense that we ought to be pretty damn explosive. Why aren't we? Or why aren't we? Why aren't those guys always on the field? Like, what's going wrong? And if you throw in getting a new quarterback in there, there's actually an opportunity to say we're going to be a little less quarterback centric and we're going to develop around that quarterback a little bit more. Because I think what we've all seen in this last however many years is if you decide that the quarterback is the superstar you and you don't put enough around him, that superstar gets hurt, he makes mistakes, and people are frustrated with him. And I think that's what happens. They, they've built the entire offense around Adrian, and I think as a result – he makes spectacular plays, but he also gets hurt and he frustrates people. Hmm. So that's the vision. I, I, you know, I don't know how they're going to resolve those things because they're going to go into the transfer portal. They have to. And you're living dangerously in the transfer because you oh, don't know you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know who's nope. available. You don't know who your competition is. You can't recruit it until they transfer. Exactly. You don't have a board. So you you react. It's a reactionary thing. It's not something well, like that you Caden can Lyles plan is for. on the board, right? The Wisconsin guy that played thirty four sure. games at offensive line. He goes on your board. But for the most part, is guys that guy are going to wait. Wisconsin? Is he going to Nebraska? Probably not. But he's on your board. Sure, but, but and for the most part, you're going to wait till seasons are over. Then guys are going to jump in. They're going to move on one way or another. Guys from Nebraska will probably jump in and move on somewhere else. And so yeah, it's just to me, it's it's a really. It's it's just it's a it's a gamble. It's a big risk because you can't build it if you're not going to build it traditionally through the high school ranks and kind of know what you have the way the defense has done it. Right. Then you got to hope the right guys are in there that they come and join you. And then even just hearing players this week talk about their their transfer portal journeys a little bit. Just because they come in right away doesn't mean everyone's going to – they're not a plug-and-play. They still have to learn the system. They still have to be healthy. We've seen in some instances where guys bring injuries with them that they didn't know they had. Yeah. So it's just – it's such, it's a quick fix that, that can work. I mean, Michigan State did it pretty well this year. But, man, I don't know. It's just not a sustainable thing, and, and I think that, the, that that's their strategy in year four or after year four. I don't know. It's, it's telling that – they it, the, the foresight wasn't there that now on the back end they really need to scramble to, to fix some things. Was that a, is that also a product of the hot seat that we're talking about here? Like they, Scott knows I've got to get this thing rolling in a hurry, yeah. and you know no matter like I have I've had a couple of strong recruiting classes now. That's not gonna I need to fix things quicker than that. You know it, maybe f- it is the best thing for the program's future three five years from now to to hit the trail hard again. But for me who needs to wants to keep doing this. I need to bring in some older guys that I think can make an impact right away. We're going to talk about basketball in a minute, but I think that Frost has changed from a F it. We'll play freshmen. We'll play seven of them if we have to. We'll play them all season. We're going to get the kind of freshmen who want to play and can play and, you know, are a revelation in the Big Ten to we need to be a developmental program. Mm. We need to uh, we need to find our share of Luke Grimers and the walk-ons, and then we need to find, uh, you know, we need to find a – uh, a tight end like Austin Allen, who's going to be an NFL player, and he is. He's an NFL prospect in year five. And we need to find a Damian Daniels who, oh, he's, he's going to be a little raw around the end just for a couple of years, but by year four he's going to be he's going to be tough and so on and so forth. Hmm. Like I think they they now want to be the program that gets the rocks and over time puts them in the tumbler. And polishes them up over time. And then they, you know, then it's a jewel. But I don't, I th- you've seen this shift in their recruiting philosophy and their emphases. I think mm-hmm. they're going more toward, hey, let's get height, let's get length, let's get weight, you know, let's get big guys. But we can't, we have to become a developmental program. And the problem with that is that they have so many young guys in the program that they want to develop that I think they just don't want to they don't want to move on from them you know and they they've got a glut of players and they didn't make a decision beforehand on what they were going to do with the juniors well they left it to the juniors to decide well they didn't have to 
there could have been a very clear conversation of now what do you think before the season hey we need to know because we need to know, we we need to we need to know the spots because we have to have a clean number of spots that we know we're going to go after and if there's 17 of you guys and you guys get an extra year we want to gauge your opinion now and maybe they did this what do you think is this it is this your is this your senior year um again i'm a different kind of person I would have almost exclusively said, this is your final year. I would have said, this is it. You're the last ride here, barring something unforeseen, I want you to put everything into this season because we're recruiting. We're, we we got to keep getting high school players. And I think Nebraska is a loyal program. I'm not, you know, I'm obviously a different person. But I'm not saying I'm not loyal. But I'm saying that, like, I think Nebraska was like, yeah, we're going to let these guys decide. And, like, it surprises me that a seventh-year linebacker needs to come back. Sure. Like, I would say, mm, you're good. I'm sorry that happened. You know, we got Nick, we got Luke. But I think they actually want him back because I think he can be good in pass, pro, pass coverage. But do you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm a bigger believer in the system needs to be right. I need to have clarity in my decision-making. And I feel like Nebraska's got very little clarity. I mean, let's say they make a bowl, Evan. Let's say they do. Let's say they win three of the last four. And it's December 1st. And these kids are hitting the transfer portal. And you don't know how many spots you got because your season isn't over. Mm-hmm. Do you go to the kids in December 1st and go, all right, guys, we're 6-6. Six and six. Is this going to be your last game? Okay. Like, what do I you do? I think you do. I would think so. I think so. a lot of players these days treat those bowl games as extraneous to the season. Uh, you know, Brendan Hymas last year treated that extra game as such and, and moved on, and, and I think people generally understood that. But but does that make sense? Yeah. I think like, to They may not be able to get to the portal until January if they go to a bowl game because they won't necessarily know how many people are leaving. To Sam's point about having the conversation at the beginning of the year, it, I don't have a problem with going to anyone before the bowl game and saying, hey, checking in with you. How are you feeling about this? But it's weird to do that if you haven't broached it before. I know. It's weird to do that, and then you wait all this time, and you're not going to wait the extra three weeks to just wait for the season to end? That, that's a weird – that's that's not great decision-making And right to there. be clear, if 15 of those juniors come back, then what they did was really smart because what they did was they were like – we think all these guys are going to come back, and we're going to be really, really seasoned next year because mm-hmm. we'll, we'll have 15, 60-year seniors. Then it's genius, and that may be what happens. You know, um, it may be that everybody but two or three just say, hey, I'm coming back. Year six, baby, let's roll. And then Nebraska looks really smart because basically what they did is they, they recruited back 10 starters. So we'll just see. But you're right in the sense that it's risky. Um you know, I think they knew before the season that Brendan Hymas was not going to come back. Yeah, he looked the part of an NFL. I think that was that pretty. Point. That was pretty understood. Mm-hmm. So, I agree. Like they knew that. I think that was his decision, and I think Farniak was at that decision. I'm not sure that when they went in after the game against Rutgers that they were sure that all those players were coming back on defense. Oh, they I gave don't them, think they knew. No, they gave they them time. Meetings. And remember, yeah. I was skeptical that. I didn't think they'd all come back. Right. And a lot of them did. The only one who didn't was Boodle. Boodle, yeah. So, you know, I don't know. But that's that's a big question of, like, recruiting matters. I know Trevor Albers looks at recruiting, too. I know it matters to him. So he's paying attention, and that strategy needs to pay off. I certainly don't think we have a great grasp on whether Adrian Martinez is coming back. Do we think – I don't think that – well, we are in, in as in the dark on that as we could possibly be. What is the gap between what we know about that decision and what the Nebraska coaching staff knows about that decision, do you think? I don't think it's that big. I, I mean, I think they don't – I think they want him back. Scott Frost said as much before this, the season. Yeah. Oh, there isn't any question. They'd love to have him back. I think oh, yeah. you hear all – you see all these Big Ten coaches embracing Adrian and whispering in his ear after the game. I think, you know, there's some other schools that would love to – Oh, they're telling him goodbye. I, I think there's oh, come a, come play for us next year. I don't know what they're doing, but like if I don't see you again in this league, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate everything you've done. Mm. I, the, the other point I wanted to make with the, this 
senior junior thing is like ab- in an abstract sense it makes sense to kind of have them declare earlier but like if you know these guys as coaches and you're developing them and you know that like maybe they want to go to the NFL you got to see how the season plays out like yeah. like Damian Daniels has I think drastically increased his pro stock over these last eight games uh, I think Austin Allen has been that way too but then there are some other guys who you know maybe it hasn't turned out quite that way and maybe one more year of tape to work to, to develop and work toward their dreams like you know if that's the goal as a coach or one of your goals then you know I, I can see where they're coming from but and it doesn't put you in a corner that, that conversation like when you guys got to your senior years of college you know if somebody had come up to you and said you know I'll tell you what we'll we'll pay for your tuition all of it the whole tuition just to come to college for an extra year, do what you're doing at the DN. What was the paper at the uh, the post? The post. Do just keep doing what you're doing. Maybe do a little bit more. How about it? Would you have said yes? I'd just, thumb, I'd thumbs up that one. Really? Yeah. I'd think about it. Yeah. See what kind of classes or education might yeah. play into that. I mean, you'd have yeah. to, you know. You I, still, I, mean, I still had a lot With of the knowledge really that you're here. postponing your professional career. Does this make sense? Yeah, like but, you don't get to do both. You get to only do one. So if somebody says, I'm going to pay for your tuition to stay here, or you can go out and get a job. It's so nuanced, though, because like for some of these guys, it would be eating off a year of their potential NFL career. For other guys, they probably know that they're not yeah. going to be playing That's in the league. Point. And so, hey, let's hang on for another year in football before I get a job as you know a, an accountant or a you know whatever right. that I'm doing after that. Out of that. those juniors, there's quite a few NFL like pre-agent or draftees, though. I mean, seriously. I'm not. I'm not blowing smoke. There, there are. So then it becomes like, do you want to spend a f- couple years on a practice squad and maybe get called up, or do you want one more year in college where you can have take some free classes, get some money, maybe go to a bowl game? Like, I agree. I think it, I think the NIL uh, legislation does change that conversation. It used to be so much more black and white even three years ago, but now. I think it is. It's a very, it's a very um, personalized, nuanced discussion that's going to be really interesting to follow from January pro- or December into January here in the off season. Yeah. Let's go to basketball then. Let's. We, we I am sitting here with the last two beat writers of Nebraska basketball. Sam did it last year. Jimmy, you're embarking on it now. Uh, let's. I mean, you, you rolled out the preview uh, stuff this week, which was really good, breaking down the positions. What I'm curious, what surprised you or, or was interesting to you as you did that? And then in a bigger sense from, from either of you guys, like what are some just big picture narratives this year that, that you're looking for and that people can be looking for? Surprises. I was surprised with how much I was on board with the Wilhelm Breidenbach hype because you look at that guy. I mean, he's got, he's got the goggles. He's got the lumberjack beard. And he's a skinny fella. He is. But the dude is so skilled. I mean, there are the cl- clips exist of this six ten wildebeest looking creature running fast breaks, dribbling behind his back, and it's high school. He's not and he's not going to do a ton of that here. But sure, he's going to. They're going to use him to facilitate. They're going to let him dribble the ball in the half court. He's going to play. If I if he was twenty thirty pounds no fifteen twenty pounds heavier. I'd say he would. He he might be able to usurp Derek Walker as the starter by the end of the year. The coaches love him so much. He's got. He's such a. He's such a perfect modern big. He has such a great skill set for what Hoiberg wants to do. Um, so there's a surprise. Big picture narratives. Uh, I wrote about Bryce McGowan yesterday. Quick sidebar on on him sort of embracing this role as. Uh, face of the program and that I think that he's right to embrace that because whether anyone wants to you know whether anyone in Nebraska wants to embrace that around him or not it's true I wrote this in his uh, little capsule preview he is the single most important player on this team not just this year I mean any of the guys who stay from this year's team next going forward they you could argue they won't have as much of an impact on Nebraska basketball going forward as McGowan's because they grabbed, they got the shiny star. They grabbed it. They, they, they hoped for it. They reached for it. They grabbed it. They got it. How he, how his experience goes at Nebraska will go a long way to determining whether they can get another one. If Bryce, you know, raises his draft stock here, has a great year, 
I think there's a pretty good chance that they can get some of these guys who are visiting football games to to actually sign here. If he's miserable here with his brother here and doesn't go well, that's that's not great. I mean, I, I, Matt Abdelmassi's uh, track record of, of recruiting guys is is proven. I'm not going to say that he wouldn't be able to pull it, but it would be harder. It would be harder if this Bryce thing doesn't go well. And so we have Bryce as sort of the figurehead of the entire thing, but th- you contrast that with they all. It's a egal- it's an egalitarian style that Fred's trying to play, and it's supposed to be all for one. You know, five be- five pieces. Yeah. You know, the machine looks great when everyone's doing their part. Sure. And you, the price isn't the only guy with a lot to gain from this season. Alonzo Verge tested the NBA draft waters last off season, and I think he, he, I mean, he said it. The biggest sell for him was the NBA system here. He thinks I'm, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, but I'm just connecting dots here. I think Alonzo Verge thinks that him playing here will show NBA guys, oh, he can do this. Right. Okay. Because I don't think he was going to get drafted last year. Right. And Trey McGowan has been, has said a couple of times that. This he wants this to be his final year. Well, he's a junior, so that means he wants to go to the NBA. So there are a lot of guys on this team with aspirations to get to that next level. And it, you know what? If they they win twenty games because they all look so great in Fred's system, maybe that can all work for everyone. It's a tricky dance to do. Hmm. That's good. Ah, uh, what do you think, Sam? I don't know that I have a lot of thoughts. Um, you know, I, I, I will look at the team thing, and, I, and I'll say that, you know, the team's got to be a lot better. And the Big Ten is tough. And uh, if, the other, if, if there's a year where it's gettable, this is yeah. – I mean, I'm not saying, like, winning the no, thing, no, no. but, like, this is an easier year. This is a year where Nebraska, based on the talent profile that it has, can get to the middle of the league. If you get to the middle of the league, you're on the bubble. Not guaranteed. Not guaranteed. But you're in the bubble. You're in the conversation, and that's that's kind of where they want to get. The thing that I will say is that, you know, it doesn't really matter whether Nebraska is a good developmental program for the NBA if they don't win games. Uh, the upshot isn't look at this player we got and look at where he's going playing. You know, this isn't the Nebraska Mad Ants. So the key <laughs> is... Not just does it improve Fred Hoiberg's personal coaching profile. You know? Mm-hmm. Win games. So I think the way that the way that, that program is run is really, really good in the sense that like there is a lot of clarity. Guys know when they're moving on. They're moving on, right? I'm sure Trey understands that like, hey, this this is it. And we're gonna keep we're gonna keep adding guys to the team that we think can help. So you can't expect back here in March uh, to be where you are in July. How do we know? Because we added Alonzo Verge. We didn't just let Delano Banton leave and then say, "Well, Trey, score a few more." No, no, we added a guy that's gonna score more than you. So they're they're good in that way. Like I appreciate I appreciate that um, that kind of approach ideally should produce the kind of results that put, you know, butts in the seats at PBA and, and, and get them in the conversation for postseason. Whether it's NIT or NCAA, I got to be honest with you, I don't know that Nebraska fans care that much. I'm not trying to say it isn't important to win NCAA tournament games. I think it is. But if you told me Nebraska's going to go to the postseason the next six years, four of those are going to be NITs, two of those are going to be NCAAs, and they're going to win one, just one NCAA tournament game, they might be talking about putting a statue of Hoiberg out there. Like, it, it's, not, it's not like it has to be a genius. Or they have to go, you know, 30 and 5, 30 and 2. They just have to, they have to get back to that point. And what I will say is we've probably reached that moment in the program where, you know, talking about the NBA – Will will only have resonance if you're winning games. Like Mike Riley ran an NFL offense. Who cares? They didn't win, and every people actively disliked him for it. So, 
now Nebraska basketball fans are a lot more lenient, but this will be that year where, you know, based on the talent they have, and it's Jimmy wrote a great story about the most talented team, the last most talented team in 95-96. Hmm. And that team did have a total default. They won the NIT, though. If this team wins the NIT, I mean, Fred's getting an extension. And he's getting a raise. So <laughs> that was that was almost the end of Danny Nee's career. But if that happens here, now, Fre- Fred's going to be able to go out and sign three five-stars. This is proof that we can do it. You know, I mean, that's, that's what it'll be. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, like, the bar is not that high. And it's time to clear it. And, you know, last year I think they thought they had a really good team. They scheduled really aggressively in the golden window. Then that whole thing fell apart. Probably good that it did because they were 7-20. and 20. But, you know, you want to have grace. Their COVID stuff was a mess, and they had a hard go. And Banton, you know, he was um, – I still haven't <laughs> written this story yet, but the food thing last year was a real problem for this program. They were – they were uh, – they didn't get the – they didn't get the training table the way the football team did. They just get a meal sent over. And so a lot of times they didn't know what meal they were going to get, and the meal was – so Lat Main was telling me about a time that I think Delano sent everybody a group test. He said, what is this? And all these guys are not from Nebraska. Like they don't. They're used to specific kind of foods. And so like you'll ask, like, what what do you wish you had on that? Because they're like, we want the bar, because then we can make our choices and we can kind of and they're like, there's some guys on the team, like pasta is what they eat every day. And, you know, you gotta have pasta. They maybe eat something else, but pasta is where they start. And some of those times, those meals are just – so the team lost a lot. It just did, and that's all back, and so I think they're going to be much better. The presence around Nebraska basketball is so interesting because Bryce comes up and talks yesterday. Nobody really – I don't know anybody requests him to come up and talk. He just comes up. This is great. They do the media stuff so well. And, you know, he's got 25 people around him. I think he handles that pretty well. Um, what you hope is that – there's success early so that you can kind of get the hype out of the way and then you can just start playing basketball. Um, and, you you know, and hopefully the team's winning because if the team wins early, then it doesn't really become about Bryce. It becomes about, hey, man, might go somewhere, might, might make a tourney, and that helps everybody. So hopefully the focus can shift away because Abdul Massey said, and he said it jokingly, but he's like, he's like, uh, anybody else getting tired of Bryce talking? I know I'm getting tired. He was joking. But I think the point was, all right, let's play some basketball. Let's stop talking about what we're going to do and what, what he could mean. And let's just see what, he, see what he does. Let's win some games. And then all of a sudden Bryce is going off to the NBA after av- averaging 12 and 6. And, and next to the resume, it's led Nebraska to the NCAA tournament. And you talk, you, you have a story on every guy on the team. It's not just Bryce, but it's well, Lad averaged seven and he hit a bunch of threes. That kind of thing. Does so that make sense? Yes, you covered a lot of ground there, and I, I love. Know. I'm sorry. I love your Nebraska Mad Ants line. That was very right. good. Yeah, I would say that I think one one goal will beget the other. If Nebraska can put all this talent together, and and form a cohesive unit out of a lot of parts that are very talented individually, then you're going to see more, you know, more success begets more right. NBA guys. If they make the tournament run and Alonzo Verge scores, you know, 27 in a Big Ten Conference semifinal tournament game and, you know, has eight assists in that game, he, he'll have a better chance of, of getting drafted. Trey McGowan's, you know, though a lot of NBA teams – are, it's the dog days of the regular season during March, mm-hmm. so their eyes are glued to that stage. And, they, and <laughs> there's an element of old school scouting where they want to see what you do on that big skate, big I, stage. It's it's really it cool. Bowl games, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's really cool that you you know had a great game in the you know if they if they someone goes off against Auburn in Atlanta, that's fine. Mm-hmm. It's a whole different deal if you do that in the Big Ten tournament or in an NCAA tournament game. So I do think that. The Nebraska, the Nebraska Mad Ants can, sure, can it can be a self fulfilling prophecy. How much money did uh, Davion Mitchell make, for example, in the NCAA tournament? Probably point. quite a bit. Yeah, I don't know what he was. He was not going to be a top ten pick before no. then. No, and he was the best player in the tournament, so it helped. Yes. But 
No, that's that's a good point. And again, um, the thing that I appreciate about Fred Hoiberg and his system and the way they play is that when you watch the basketball game, you know why they won and lost. Mm-hmm. There's such clarity there. Oh, and he'll um, tell you. The muddy. Yeah, but like you can watch it sure. and know. Sure. Like there was a little bit of muddy with, with Teddy Allen and kind of doing things that were not really in the system. But, you know, you knew. Like at the end of the game, you knew why they lost. You knew you could kind of sense that. And, you in, you know, there's a good beat pool that covers the team. It's smaller, obviously, than football. But everybody kind of has a gist. And so when you'll do the post-game interviews, you know, I can name these people fine. You'll ask a question. Robin will ask a question. Baznet will ask. And it all kind of – Jacob will ask a question. It all fits into the puzzle of we just watched the game and we kind of know based on how we know about Fred that we know why the game turned out the way it did. And it's a very or it's a very organized post game because Fred just kind of goes through it. Yeah, you're right. Good question. This was this was this. And so you know. And so the, one of the cool things about watching then is I think fans can go and they can say because they're going to be able to go now to the court and to the games. And when you watch them run the court, you're going to say, "All right, I know what they're trying to do here." When they don't get early offense, you'll know what what they want to do. What's their secondary offense? He calls great plays. He hates it when guys get to that 12-foot spot and then they just bail and do a stupid shot or they draw a charge. Like, people will figure out his culture right away in person. And this team actually has it. His first team, which is what fans saw, was such a mishmash of differing styles and guys that didn't know what they were doing and freshmen that were shooting threes who couldn't hit them. And so, like, there was a lot of things going on there. So people will enjoy genuinely enjoy watching it it'll be like and i'm not trying to knock nebraska here it'll be like watching creighton creighton when you watch them you know what they're trying to do and this will be the one year where nebraska looks like they know what they're trying to do and creighton's still trying to learn hmm. go to picks picks evan has taken the lead watch out i'm gonna okay. start running the ball so actually i'm sorry he's not you're not behind one jimmy you're behind two i'm behind ten so Sense of urgency. Once Evan, when Evan gets in, he starts playing the numbers. He's like blackjack now. So you have to take chances. You got to hit. Evan does not like when I take chances. You, you got to hit on eighteen. What? Well, that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> Taking chances and playing foolishly are two very different things. What'd you do? What did you do? I hit on twelve probably when I wasn't supposed to. Something like that. He'll he'll signal me. He will. Did he do this. Uh, he he he'll. Whoa. He'll, yeah, it's not just He'll me, tiger It's me. not just it's me. It's true. It's true. You're not supposed to hit on 12. We have the dealer showing a bus card. Yeah. Okay. And other people, including the dealer, are like, uh, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I've been All steered right. wrong by dealers before. Yeah, well. Anyway, I, let's go I to the picks. That. You ready? Iowa, Wisconsin. Whew. I guess uh, got to start throwing down the field at some point, right? Wisconsin. I think Can they're actually favorites. I'm going to go Iowa, though. Why? Are they actually favorites? I think Wisconsin oh, is the snap. favorite. Yeah. yeah, they are. Huh. Oh, I was coming off a of bye, are they not? Yeah. And, you know, I just, I think they're not as bad as Purdue made them look. I like their chances. Wisconsin. Rutgers, Illinois, at Illinois. Rutgers, off a of bye week, at Illinois, at Illinois. <laughs> off a nine overtime game. Yeah. I, I mean, if Illinois can rebound and win this game, that's pretty impressive. I'm going Rutgers. Rutgers, too. Illinois. SMU at Houston. SMU is undefeated. Houston is 6-1. and one. I am going Houston. Cougs. Okay. Houston. Virginia at BYU. Late night game. Late night football. Bronco Mendenhall going home to his old program. Being an independent school kind of rocks sometimes. Yeah. You get so many cool matchups. Yep. BYU. I feel like I've fallen back on BYU quite a bit, but I'm going to do it again. They're at home. I like their chances. Yeah, I'm going to take Virginia. Uh, they have a dynamic offense. I like the Hoos. They go by Wahoos, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fresno State at San Diego State. This Whew. this is uh, probably the two best teams in the Mountain West, yeah. but they're on the same side, if I'm not mistaken. So, Okay, I didn't know that think they're on the same side 
I think the mountainside is led by Air Force, or maybe Boise. I think Air Force, actually. We'll see. I'll, I'll go take, Fresno. Fresno. I got San Diego State. Good defense. You have SDSU? I do. I'm going to go Fresno, too. You know who the coach at uh, Fresno or San Diego State is, right? It's your boy. Oh, Bra- Brady Hoke. Brady Hoke, yeah. yeah. That's right. Texas at Baylor. Texas. Okay. Texas. You f- both feel pretty good about that. Nice season for Baylor, though. Not a believer in Dave Aranda. Texas. Florida, Georgia. World's Georgia. largest cocktail party. I don't know if it is a cocktail party anymore with COVID. Yeah, it's a good Jackson. question. Yeah. World's largest uh, sealed water bottle Socially party. distanced. Yeah. Takeout drinking drinks. Drinking afternoon. Yeah. They uh, might have the biggest video board I've ever seen, incidentally, at that stadium. Like, it's huge. It, like, well, it's not as big as the one in Atlanta or in Dallas. But the one that just comes out of the ground, that thing runs the entire length of an end zone hmm. in Jacksonville. This is going to be a really cool game. I got Georgia. until I, I just got to see it until it happens. Yeah, their defense is too dominant. Georgia. Georgia for me. Ole Miss at Auburn. Ole Miss. Uh oh. It feels going. like a toss up to me, but it's in Auburn, so I'm going Auburn. Going against uh going against Bo Nix. I know. Love hate. That Love hate with me. Bo. That just that really surprises me, even wounds me a little bit. I'm gonna go Auburn. I put A B U. Uh North Carolina at Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Yeah, I guess. Notre Dame. Didn, 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 didn. Notre Dame. Penn State at Ohio State. Uh, Buckeyes. I think Buckeyes by a lot. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, it's okay. it's falling apart in Penn State. James Franklin's thinking about <laughs> Illinois. Evan, Evan, what we going, the... He thinks they're going to the big house. It's all very confusing. <laughs> Evan was reading me the James Franklin. For those who don't know, people were asking James Franklin about the USC rumors, and he was telling everyone how he was focused, locked in on, on Illinois this week, and he <laughs> couldn't wait to go to the big house. Neither of those things have anything to do with Ohio State, so that man's under a lot of stress right now. He he said the big house? He so he's looking boy, forward to going oh to the big house. And he's maybe really he focused on Illinois? Maybe he did that on purpose. I listened to the audio. I don't think so. I mean, maybe, but I don't think so. It was so. really weird. Ohio State. Michigan, Michigan State. <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to this game. That'll be fun. I think this is where Michigan State comes down to earth. I think the Wolverines, too many athletes. Michigan. I kind of like Michigan State's offense more than Michigan, but I, I don't know. I trust the Wolverines a little bit more. Michigan. I thought about this one a lot. I'm going uh, I'm going, little brother. Okay. Michigan State. I, that'd that'd be fun. I, just, I don't know. I don't know why. And Purdue, Nebraska. We've been have we been all in Nebraska two weeks in a row, or yeah, two have. two games in a row. Yes. I think we might be again Nebraska. Yeah, I think for a lot of the reasons we talked about with the buys, Nebraska coming off its Purdue with the Iowa Wisconsin two step, the matchups better. <sighs> Nebraska's burned me so many times <laughs> on these kind of picks, but I, it just feels like this is a, a time they come up and win by a couple scores. I took the Skurs. I'm tired of picking them to be honest with you. But I have to again. Hope springs There's eternal. some difference. There's some difference in the picks this week. Yeah. Between Evan and Jimmy, though, there are only let's see one, I think two, two, three, three, three different picks. So, Ole Miss, Auburn, Iowa, Wisconsin, Fresno State, San Diego State. Oh, this is the week you gain a bunch of ground. Me? Sure. No, I don't think so. But I, I took some risks. I took a chance. <laughs> Very good. Well, we will take a chance by taking the week off and coming back next week with another Pick 6 podcast. Yeah, we're going to take the week off. We're not, we're gonna well, you know, the, the next game. six days. I mean, well, yeah, well, from this <laughs> we podcast. Last week we'll be able to chance. recap two exhibition games Ooh. for hoops. Mm-hmm. That's fun. Maybe we could talk a little volleyball, too. Yeah, coming Playing off the Wisconsin game. Wisconsin-Minnesota, so we'll know, we'll know how good, just how good they are. That'll be fun. Enjoy the game this weekend. Uh, it's getting colder. Break some leaves. Should be fantastic. Thanks for listening. We will see you next week.